All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, it's like 5 a.m., and um, I've been trying to record this video, and uh, I just recorded 30 minutes plus, and I don't know, my phone is not really taking it. So I'm just going to record a video to basically tell you that I'm not going to record a video today because I still have a bunch of stuff to do, and it's already 5 a.m., and... Um, I'm not really that much in the mood for doing a whole lot. Anyway, this is an educational channel, and we're trying to look at uh, the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson, a 452nd video of his. All I'm going to tell you today is that he proposed his two uh, fundamental postulates in 1959. They were about how the universe operated, and he... Um, then tried to construct a theoretical universe, which was a, a series of deductions from his postulates. And um, then he wrote books kind of comparing his theoretical universe with the actual measured universe of the scientists. And he was able to arrive at some incredible... Um, findings that really agreed he's very basically able to reproduce many of the scientific tables just from theory, just from his head, uh, the principles in his head, and um, with no money, uh, and these army of scientists with uh, huge budgets, uh, he was able to reproduce what they did strictly from theory. So I believe that there's really something to what he was talking about, and um, we're going over his book that's called Basic Properties of Matter. All I'm going to do really today is go over his two fundamental postulates, which are basically seven assumptions about how uh, he in, uh, induced, through inductive reasoning, uh, how the universe operated taking just massive quantities of data and um, a few epiphanies and um, crunching all that up and figuring out uh, how the general principles of the universe operated. So the first aspect of his study was inductive. And then the second, after he proposed the postulates, was deductive, taking his general principles and then applying it to specific situations, um, and then arriving at his theoretical universe. Larson's reciprocal system is also known as the universe of motion, and that is because he tried to construct his universe upon motion. Uh, other people have tried that before. Um, such as Thomas Hobbes and Rene Descartes. Uh, Larson is the first one to really make it work and turn it into a generalized theory of the universe. Now, that's why Larson calls it the reciprocal system of theory. It's a system of theory. It's a system, meaning that if you understand how the system works, you can apply it to any subject. It is a, uh, an interrelated network of different subjects. You can have reciprocal chemistry, reciprocal astronomy, reciprocal economics, you know, reciprocal religion, and so on. And it's all based on the universe of motion. The first postulate is that um, I kind of like to break it down into the uh, seven assumptions. And the... Uh, First assumption is that the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion. Then motion um, comes in three dimensions. Motion comes in discrete units. And motion um, is made of uh, two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, so the universe is made out of motion. Motion is a relationship in, between space and time. And space and time and motion 
have three dimensions and they come in only discrete units. That's his first postulate. And his second postulate is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. The second postulate is more axiomatic. It's just kind of like if you do science, you need to, uh, you know, agree that math works, you know, and geometry works. Uh, I actually disagree with a good portion of that second postulate because I think there are uh, geometrical systems that are more inclusive than Euclidean. The Euclidean geometry is a geometry of the universe, but uh, there are uh, other geometries that also include Euclidean geometry that are more descriptive of the whole universe. And uh, I also think that in certain circumstances, the commutative mathematics part may not apply. So, uh, and um, I'm getting a lot of my critiques on that from other uh, of Larson's uh, uh, associates or researchers. The first postulate is where most of the work gets done. Basically, uh, space uh, motion uh, is uh, what he calls a scalar motion. And this is a motion with a magnitude, but no specific direction. So the universe is made out of scalar motion. You can model this with a balloon that you put dots on. Uh, you blow up the balloon, all the dots are moving away from each other. The motion uh, is either inward or outward, depending on whether you're blowing up or sucking in the balloon. If you're moving away, if, uh, if you're blowing out, the dots are all moving away from each other. If you suck in, all the dots are moving toward each other, but they're not moving in any specific direction, or rather they're moving in every direction. Every dot is moving uh, away from every other dot on the expanding balloon. Larson calls that the progression. Uh, the uh, Sucking in the balloon is the gravitation. All the dots are moving toward each other. And if you assign a reference point, it appears as if all the dots are moving. Uh, it, it appears that one dot is motionless then. You assign a reference point, this dot is motionless. Well, then you can now measure the directions to the other dots. And it appears as if there is a force field between your dot and all the other dots. Like all the other dots are attracted by your dot. None of that is true. And Larson calls that as if force. It appears as if there's a force field, but actually every dot is pursuing its own course. They're all moving toward all others. And uh, the, the direction is actually a quality of the reference point and not of the motion, scalar motion itself. And then motion for Larson is the relationship between space and time. All motion uh, is, and basically all scientific phenomena are motions, matter, energy, force, acceleration, pressure. These are all kinds of motion. And every kind of motion is a fraction with space or time as the numerator and time or space in the, as, as the denominator, except that time or space can come in multiple dimensions. So you can have Time to the third power over space to the third power. That's matter. Time over space. That's energy. Time over space to the fourth power. That is pressure. Space over time to the second power. That is uh, acceleration. And so on. So that is a great system of units that you can use uh, to check your work. And uh, it's much easier than dealing with the MKS system, which has also got matter in there. You can turn all matter into time to the third power over space to the third power. Everything works out to just time and space, um, which makes it a lot easier than dealing with three variables. Um, space and time come in three dimensions. Uh, that's coordinate space, three dimensions of space. But that's really when you assign a reference point. You stop the universe, and then the three dimensions become still, um, like space, like we're accustomed to. 
and then, but time is still moving in a scalar manner. Time is getting later and later and later. But if you, um, you can do that also with time. Uh, and so you end up with a three-dimensional uh, vectorial spatial reference system. And you also have, can get a three-dimensional temporal reference system. Three dimensions of time in a still frame and space is progressing. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart, but in no specific direction like on the surface of an expanding balloon. Uh, and space, time, and motion come only in discrete units, um, meaning that you have to have a full unit of space before you have space, and you have to have a full unit of time before you have time. If you have one unit of space and one unit of time, you have what Larson calls unit speed. Space over time is speed. The car is moving 10 miles an hour. 10 miles of space and one hour of time. One unit of space and one unit of time is unit speed, which is also known as the speed of light. That is the background speed of the universe of motion. The universe is always moving at the speed of light outward in all directions. A scalar motion of space in all directions. That is always happening. It's eternal and omnipresent. And then by turning back that motion, that is the source. You turn back that motion to get particles and atoms and molecules and aggregates by rotating that outward motion and turning it into an inward motion, which is gravitation. Gravitation is inherent in all matter, all atoms and particles uh, and uh, molecules and aggregates ha are, uh, gravi are, are, have gravity in them, inherent. So gravity, again, is not a force. It is an as-if force. It is inherent to the atom itself. All of the atoms or dots are moving on their own. There is no force field. There is no force of attraction. It just appears that way because all atoms are moving toward all other atoms. And... Um, uh, you know, in order to accept the reciprocal system, the universe of motion, you have to be able to accept the concept that motion exists before anything moving. So you got that progression of the natural reference system that is always there and that's always going to be part of the calculations it is the what Larson calls the progression of the natural reference system. So you have your spatial reference system, you have your temporal reference system. Both of those reference systems are three-dimensional in space three-dimensional in time, but in terms of motion, they are just one-dimensional. So it takes one scalar dimension to describe three dimensions of space or three dimensions of time. So your reference systems are not capable of describing Larson's universe because Larson's universe has three dimensions of motion. Uh, so he has this natural reference system, basically moving outward in three dimensions in, um, at the speed of light in all directions. And those three dimensions then need to be rolled back to turn it into matter. First, it's vibrate. You, you put in a vibratory motion into that outward motion, and that is a photon. And then that vibratory motion then gets rotated. And the first time it's rotated is really like a particle. And then that particle combines with other particles that also have photons in them. So you end up with two photons. And then you end up with various, um, various rotations, combinations of rotations. A, a full atom is three different, uh, well, it can be two different rotations that are both two-dimensional for a total of three. And uh, then there's an optional third uh, one-dimensional rotation. So Larson's periodic table looks like that. Now, um, I'm not going to be reading today. Uh, I'm going to just stop there for today. Uh, 
but we are looking at this book that's called Basic Properties of Matter. He looks at the basic properties of uh, like the melting point and boiling point and so on of uh, chemistry. And he compares his values that he derives from the equations he derives for the various properties of matter with the scientific tables. We're looking at this chapter that's called Specific Heat Patterns. And this, this particular chapter is very much in the weeds. He's like in, into details that you don't really need to know about. But I still like to read it into the record in case somebody is really up on their organic chemistry and they, uh, you know, and they understand all of this um, and they can kind of weigh it into, um, you know, their uh, legacy science viewpoint. But, um, you know, I've read this already kind of labored through it earlier and my recording didn't work and it's like I said, 5 a.m. So um, I'm going to leave it there and we'll get back to looking at the specific heat patterns tomorrow. Have a great day and hopefully I'll be a little bit more chipper tomorrow. Um, thanks for tuning in.